So I mean, it, that, it is a tough one, and um, and that's why like when we continue, we were talking about that earlier. Um, it's a it's a it's a tough one. I mean, you really should be testing your water. No, if it's, you should even be using it, and then you know. But it, at this time, it's still just a strong recommendation, but it's not a requirement under some programs. Okay. Okay. Colleen. Yes. You have um, drip irrigation, like subsurface yeah. or trickle irrigation. Um, does that still apply? It still, it still applies as far as our testing requirements, yes. And um, the delivery point is not that. Just unhook it in. Yeah, or I heard, like I remember at your farm there was, uh, Rebecca was there doing some sampling in that, right? With, um, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not going on top of the... No, nope. yeah, so you could just do, like if it's on, like if it's triple, and you would just come try and sample, like maybe slip up the hose of it so it's not, you know, okay, yeah. then you're not contaminating. But I'm not contaminating the crop by putting it on top. You could be, if your water is contaminated, through the roots and the dirt, like I'm doing. Well, ours is not greenhouse, like it's. So okay, okay so it's going right under. It's not going on top. No, that's right. So you'll see that as we get like on the slides right now. Um, but when we talk about you know methods of application, which ones are more riskier than that? That is the least risky okay. as far as uh, delivery method to your crop. But we still have. Oh, yeah, two times a year. Yeah, I mean, maybe Khadija, like when it's sub irrigation, I don't know. You should still test it as far as the source and if there's a way to test. It's trickier when it's sub irrigation, pardon? Like, so Ellen's wondering because we're saying test it two times a year, she uses sub irrigation, so below the surface. So it becomes a bit ch more challenging. Um, I don't know. I mean, you're still kind of required, so the best way you can get that at that water if it's possible, or maybe... Well, this is the point as well, yeah, as where it inserts in as close as possible. Again, it's not a requirement, and it is, the risk is really low. Yeah, yeah. so, that, yeah, <laughs> that's right. So, you know, then again, there comes a point where you might just have to justify. I mean, that is a requirement, but you're also using a very low risk of application, yeah. So, um... And then question three, so what are the acceptable limits of generic E. coli in agricultural water? So we talked about potable water, and this is agricultural water. Now, again, we haven't talked about it, but it's just seeing if you might have an idea about what it could be. And we'll talk a bit about it. So there's, you know, your choices are 0, 10, 100, 1,000. For those of you that are wondering what CFUs are, those are colony forming units. That's just a type of measurement that they use when they're doing uh, microbiolo microbiological testing for this type of application. So we'll, we'll look at these in a little bit. So that was just a sort of test your knowledge. So as we dive into this uh, topic, there's a couple of things in terminology that we need to make sure that we're all on the same page for. Um, when we talk about pre-harvest water, um, that's when we talk about the water that you're using for the, in the production of your crops. So that's prior to harvesting. So that could be your irrigation water, that might be, you know, if you're using for frost protection, I know in berries that's a, a common practice, um, or even when you're mixing agricultural chemicals, right? Because again, that's going on your product. So, you, you know, those are things just to consider. That's the water that you're using. So sometimes you're like, oh, that's agricultural, app. like those are chemical applications, that's not water, but you're using water to mix it. So again, it's just to keep in mind when you're using that water. For post-harvest water, um, that's any of the water that you're using after harvest. So that could be in a flue tank, wash tank, uh, float tank, some people call it that, um, final rinse water. So if you have a, you know, if you're washing your product. Um, and then one thing that I think gets forgotten about a lot um, is making ice. Because that, you know, if you're packing your broccoli or something to cool that product, it needs to be potable. It's touching your final product, so it's considered it, it's considered final water that's touching your product. So there's some uh, just some things to make note. This is more just to point out where it is, but as we get, go through the presentation, you'll see a little bit. Sorry, I just feel like this is there. We go. Um, you'll just see where some of those things are more applicable. So along the lines of terminology, when we talk about source water, this is. This can be looked at in a lot of different ways for the purposes, purpose of this discussion today. Source water is the point of origin for water used in food production. So um, when we're talking for pre-harvest, that could be your lakes, ponds, and streams, and rivers, wells, cisterns. Um, Post-harvest, that could be wells, municipal water. But in greenhouses, and correct me if I'm wrong, but 
when it comes to like a greenhouse or other, your, your source water could actually be the water that might be in that cistern um, or like in your flume water. So that's why people think source, but and when it's post harvest, your source is now sort of different. Now it's from the point of harvest onwards, even though like you're, where you're getting the water is still important, but it's kind of that starting point moving forward of, of the consideration for that water. And water is a bit of a complicated area when it comes to food safety but, uh, and, and meeting those requirements, but we'll try and make it as not as muddy as possible. So, um, I did mention water quality in one of those questions. So when we talk about water quality, that's measuring that, that, the condition of that water. Like, so what's in that water that's going to contribute to whether or not it's safe to use? So things, again, can be biological, could be chemical, and it could be physical. You know, if you have a lot of uh, debris, or if there's, oh, uh, you know, chemicals in the water, runoff, you know, all those things can contribute to, um, you know, the quality that you're using. Um, when we talk about water testing, though, it's typically those, the biological or the chemi chemical contaminants that we're looking for that are tested for. Um, and you can also test for other things as well. So here's that portable water. Uh, things that we talked about before. Portable water and drinking drinking water are usually kind of used interchangeably, um, but it's the water that's going to be safe for consumption, so therefore it's going to have no detectable limits for the, those um, that they're measuring for. So that's the coliforms, total coliforms, and you see it there at the bottom, or E. coli. This is generic E. coli. If your if your sample was found to have E. coli, then you would typically do further testing because if there's the thing is, coliforms is just a type of bacteria, a, a, like a, a group of uh, bacteria. Coliforms can be found in dirt, like all over the environment. Um, but when we get more specifically about E. coli, E. coli is a pathogen that's found in the you know the internal gut of uh, warm-blooded animals. So if it's being found in water, then that's an indicator that there's some sort of fecal contamination, there's a good chance for fecal contamination. So if this was found in the water, then you'd probably go and do more testing about looking for the E. coli 157 or, um, or other strains of E. coli. Could you just say what a coliform It's just a sort of like a group of a type of bacteria. Um, the, there's different um, sort of groupings of bacteria. There's like gram-positive, gram gram-negative. Like they're just sort of groupings in a coliform is like sort of like a soil bacteria. Um, it's found though, like I think continuously like all over the environment. It's just a, it's just a type of bacteria. Um, I think typically they, they used to use that one more because that was more like you know, the soil and environment, more like organic debris type, like dirt. Um, but, and that's why they tend to be a little bit more focused on the E. coli now because that's more of a good indicator because again, this is an indicator test more of an indicator whether or not there's going to be fecal contamination in that, um, in what you're testing for. So coliform is just a, it's just a type of bacteria, but they use it as, a, as an indicator organism. Um, and then potable water, uh, an important note, um, we've talked about hand washing. You need potable water for hand washing, um, for cleaning. Um, Definitely any water that's going to touch, like if it's your final product and you have several best spray rinse bar, that water needs to be potable. So any final water to touch your product needs to be potable. And again, that's where ice comes into play. Um, or if you're misting your product as well. So that, that all, those are all the requirements for potable water to uh, needed. Um, the Canadian Council, Council of the Ministers of Environment, uh, also known as the CCME, they have um, set out uh, water guidelines and they have both for agricultural water as well as drinking water standards. Uh, so agricultural water, this came up earlier about the E. coli, what's the levels that you can have. Um, agricultural water is often equated to sort of um, like beach water, you know sometimes beaches will be closed because they have a, an elevated level of contamination. Um, there is a certain level allowed but when it gets beyond that then that's when it becomes a risk. So agricultural water and usually recreational water are fairly synonymous. Um, but more specifically, when we're talking about agricultural water, if you were to have your water tested, this, these are the limits or the, the guidelines that need to be followed. So again, coliforms would need to be below this limit, so uh, less than 1,000 CFUs. And E. coli, this is where it's different, uh, that it can have you know, up to 
100 CFUs, but obviously preferably the lower the better. <coughs> and then you can see in the portable drinking standard 00, zero because you can't have anything. Okay. Um, is, are they not allowed to have two colony farm units to allow to be drinking water still, or is that like a DOE zero, but um, am I mistaken? Um, I, I mean, I think you could probably have maybe one or two coliform, you know, but typically it's zero, zero. If you were to, if it's a regulated water source, it needs to be zero, zero. So, yeah. Um, I always like to put these did you knows. Um, as you know, what pathogens, typically, especially when we're looking at viruses uh, or other types of um, like parasites, typically need a host, but we, even those, um, can survive quite a long time um, outside of their host in a surround environment if they have everything they need. So that's your moisture, the nutrients, so if you think about manure for instance, that has lots of nutrients there for pathogens to survive and a lot of moisture. Um, so if the conditions are ideal, they can leave even, they can live up to months in that surrounding environment. Um, which is another reason why, you know, cold phones come to play a little bit with, the, with that surrounding environment. Um, another interesting fact too, water can look Absolutely fantastic, but yet contain up to 100,000 coliforming units of pathogens. You know, I think that most of us have said, oh, if it's contaminated, it's going to look like this. But it's kind of like that same theory with the hands, right? Just because they're not dirty doesn't mean that they're not contaminated. That, that will make it, I'm not sure, but anyways. And then you see over here, it's, it's a little, I apologize, it's a little more difficult to see in this picture, but there's a livestock in this particular, it could be a water source that might, someone might be using for irrigation. And then our little fish guy is dead at the bottom. <laughs> so he's being, uh, the uh, level's obviously there for whatever reason. I mean, I'm not saying it's directly related to this one, but that is a, a situation that can arise in, um, when our water sources become contaminated. So water sampling. Um, when we're using water for food production, um, it should be sampled and tested on a regular basis. Again, you know, at a minimum, two times per year, but yes, ideally, more frequently, as the gentleman in the back said, it, it makes more sense to do it more frequently. Now, when we had our water tested at the facility I worked at, we did it uh, once a month, but we did four samples, and I think it cost us maybe $50 a month for four samples, and that was with them coming to our facility, picking it up, and going. So, I'm kind of find it where you do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, in on the USB stick that you're going to get, there's a, um, it says MOE licensed laboratories. So there's about three pages of licensed laboratories that do uh, both product and water testing. So you, the first column, um, I think it says, do they take outside clients? Because sometimes they're contracted to specific right. organizations. Um, so if that's your first check, make sure it takes outside clients. And there's all over Ontario, so it be London, whatever. So you'll have the name, the contact individual, or the contact, or the phone number to call. And then on the, there's five more columns, I think four or five more columns of say, uh, micro testing, chemical testing, blah, 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 blah. And then you can just find the ones that do water testing in that. Um, so you'll have that list that you can access. And then you just ask those questions. Uh, one thing to note though when you, and I, I know I talked about this later, but I'm going to talk about now. Um, if you are sending in an agricultural water sample, make sure that you identify that to the laboratory. Because if you send in an agricultural sample, you know the levels are considerably different, and they're testing it against the portable sort of requirements, you're gonna fail. So just make sure that they are aware of, you know, one, that they know what the limits are, and then two, that it's being tested accordingly because you wanna make sure that that their parameters on the machine and their equipment is set up accordingly. But post-harvest water would have to be tested the same as drinking water, wouldn't it? For most applications, depending on what it is, there are some instances in this where it gets a little bit like, some, you know, I'm, in my theory, it's just, just test it all, and, but yes, um, there are some instances where it's post harvest water use that it doesn't necessarily need to be potable, but the end result, you really need to want to achieve that, so whether it's through sanitizing the water or whatnot, so you really should have it tested under the portal. Yeah, you wouldn't have post harvest water tested under agricultural That's water. Right Sorry, I just, I'm like, I'm going in the wrong direction. Yes. So you wouldn't, anything pre-harvest, agricultural water, post-harvest, um, unless it's for like cleaning equipment and stuff, or hand washing, that can be done on the field that you want it to be portable water. Okay? When the, <coughs> when the public health comes to testing, they're testing uh, for the 
the sanitization in the water creating posts as well. Is that a home test you can do? Do they go there? Do they get access to that? Um, when the, so when the public health comes to your facility... For example, we were doing it at the show last September, uh, the, the hospital as well, so we had to <coughs> chlorine the water before right. and after. And so they're testing the sanitizer levels? Yes. Yep, you can do that on your own. There's different types of apparatus. You can get test strips, even like, you know, like for a pool. You can get test strips that can test the, the, your, okay. the effectiveness of the sanitizer. Um, but to test the potability, you should really have that sent out because it needs to be an accredited yeah, laboratory. Is that, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, okay. it's a little bit related. Being an organic farm, I am low to use chlorine. Yeah. And I've lost that battle a couple of times, but yeah. I'm not going to permanently lose it. <laughs> so I'm just trying, to, and apparently there's no uh, uh, research being done on hydrogen peroxide, which is in my experience, is going to go to for most organic farms. Right. <coughs> it's actually been taken off the CFIA approved list as oh. of 2014. Oh. And I'm frustrated because I don't want to. I don't want to work hard to grow my vegetables and then work hard to fix me as just remove them. Right. But of course, public health has their book and they follow their book. So I'm just I'm frustrated as to what I can do next to. Uh, I mean, the something that is the equivalent of putting your vegetables in bleach. Right. <sighs> and and I, unfortunately, I don't have that answer for you either, but you, I mean, depending, some of those chemicals do have where you can test the effectiveness of the sanitizer. Is there a forum to ask for an alternative sanitizing method? I don't even know that. Yeah. Probably not. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. There's got to be a place, I mean, I know that there's also commercial products like that are approved that are higher than profit that you might be able to get access to. Like, well, it's brand new, but it's got other things in it. Oh, uh, uh, I think the Pharisee is a nice one. The Pharisee is a nice one. I mean, we're mixing that ourselves. Right. Uh, but it's just basically a percentage concentration of vinegar and, and peroxide. So we're right. using that. But public health is not know much about it. And it's really hard to find good information on that particular mix. Like, what percentage? I, I just look, sorry to be a bad conversation, but we have a certified organic and nature, nature clean makes a product with hydrogen, hydrogen phosphate, and it's not party, but they've approved at least under the organic standard. Every time well, yeah, there's lots of proven organic standards, but public health is here. That's my frustration this year, and I'm gracious that so I'm not saying it's fun. I don't think that she was being. <laughs> not me, so. No, 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 and, yeah. Like for our own customers in the farmer's market, they're not going to push that, but you know, we do three or four public events a year, yeah. and they're insisting on that, and I'm having a hard time with it. Um, I can else talk. Any suggestions? <laughs> What's that? Go to her boss above. Public health, I'm sorry, really doesn't know that much. They can read their books, and that's about it. Um. Sometimes you want sympathy from somebody. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, um, I know there was a, I was at the organic show in Guelph, and I know there was a, a booth beside us. Again, it might be more along to what you were just saying, like products that were certified organic, but they looked at bring, like products that, you know, that they're bringing up and that they're, I don't know if they do the certification process, like for that, but I think it was OM Omni or something. Omni, yeah, it's just an organic And yeah, but, um, I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I can ask in our, our other unit that does more of the processing water to see if they have any more information too, because they they're more of like the the engineering aspect and the, and the processing aspect. Um, they're just like our colleagues, but they look more into the like the science aspects of those things. So there might be some information there. So I guess I guess we're going to track here. Sorry, I'm taking a little bit off track here. First, I've asked about the home testing. 
Yes. We the bacteria and then we use peroxide to prove that my bacteria levels were within acceptable levels, then I can do that. But if I can't do a home test, and my last water test in the Jersey Wall was over $200, I'm not doing that very often. Right, yeah, no. Yes. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sort of promoting one over the other, but again, the facility we, we used SGS out of London, um, and that's what we were able to send four samples in, and it was only, like I said, about like $50 or $50 for four samples. Okay. Um, but, uh, and that's a good question to ask them because on that list too that, uh, that you'll have access to because there's uh, different, definitely different areas that you can go to. So I do a little bit of shopping around there if you could. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, uh, so the minimum sampling requirements. Um, first, before, uh, before we get into the requirements, there are proper procedures that you should follow. And depending on where you're having that water tested, uh, they might have a specific procedure for you to follow, so obtain that from them. They will also have the sampling containers that you should put it in, rather than, I think you can just use a glass jar at home, you can't. Um, and they only usually have like a little bit of a buffering solution that helps with the, that just maintains the, uh, I don't want to say the quality, but just means maintains your product until it gets to them. Um, but just make sure that you do have the proper equipment before you set up to do that. And, understand what you're supposed to do. Um, so there are the minimum requirements, so at your source and product delivery, so for example, if you had a well and you're using that for irrigation and you do it, if you could sample at the well or some, you know, as close to the well you could, and then a nozzle delivery point if that was an option for you. Um, Pre-season, uh, prior to use, and then sometime during mid-season is the minimal requirement, but obviously, you know, the more the better so that you can identify if there's trends or different times that's more appropriate. Um, and from using it maybe closer to harvest. So those are things that can help you uh, with that. Um, there's just an example of some example bottles. Um, again, I apologize the pictures are small, but you also have pictures in your um, in your book, nice and big, because of our printing issues. But um, <laughs> so this person at the bottom um, is sampling from a pond, so you can see it's on a quite a large stick. So you don't want to be sort you know, you want to try and get somewhere in the middle as best as possible. You don't want to be around the edges or at the surface. You don't want to be scraping the bottom of the pond either. So just to get you know, a best representation of your sample as possible. Um, and then this one, um, if someone, you know, take the sample from the nozzle of the irrigation pipe. And then another important point is, well, after you take your, after you take your samples, um, make sure you, like, refrigerate them right away, put them in the cooler or refrigerated cooler. Um, and they should get to that sampling facility within 24 hours if you can, just, again, to help maintain the integrity, integrity, that's integrity of the sample so that it can be tested. Because if it sits at room temperature you do have an issue, if you didn't, then things might grow there and it might not be a true sample or representation of what you have in the bottle. Video. Yay. Okay. So, and I, it's a little bit skinny, but you'll still be able to see it on there. Um, just because we couldn't, for some reason, the to see it, it's, I don't know, it's just we're having issues saving it in the right uh, format. Um, just, this is how not to sample your water. So do not sample your water this way. But maybe it'll add some light humor to, for today. So let me just put the full screen in. So he doesn't really make it. <laughs> I don't know if you can. I don't know if I, if I close those. I don't think any difference are wrong. Probably not. But I can't better. Is it a little bit? Yeah, maybe just for this one. Because I, I know it's not the greatest quality either. It looks like a home, a home video. But, uh,
Oh. Take that away. Even like for your own 
hole. Yep. Um, what if something came back that it wasn't? Like the, the, there was numbers there. Yep. Uh, we'll, we will talk about that. Okay. So when we get there, and if there's yep. still a lot of dust, we can yep. even just remind you yourself again. Um, so, and then that's the next point. You know, make sure you're understanding what your water results are telling you. And then if there is an adverse effect, understand, you know, sort of the things you want to go through. Um, this is not an official sampling method, but this is a fairly generic example. And again, it's in your book, but I do strongly recommend um, that you, you know, you get the one from the facility that you're sending your water sample to when they can. Sorry, do you have a question? No? Okay. Um, yeah. You know, so, yes. Uh, so when you send it in, do you just get either a pass or a fail, or do they give you the actual levels? They will give you an actual water test result, and they'll say, they'll tell you what the limit they're using, and, they'll, and I'll show you, we have some in the book, and then we have, there's an example on here as well. So you'll kind of see, they all are maybe different on how they package the information, but no, we'll say pass or fail. Now, I think with public health, um, like if you have um, workers staying on your premises, uh, they'll come in and they want to make sure that their facilities are good, so in that case, I think it's more of a pass fail there. No, they um, do. Oh, they put the zero. Zero. So I, I've, I've seen it both ways, but so they'll put your limits on there. So they'll, you know, they'll test it. But usually, when it actually comes back from the lab, if that's who you're getting it from, they'll say, you know, I have all these like ID of the sample and time and blah blah blah, blah sort of the sampling method, the testing method, and then the limits, and sometimes even the parameters of which um, the, the test can be under. Um, so again, and we saw that in that video a little bit, but um, those those bottles that they send you, they are sterile. So you know, there's a reason why they're wrapped, and there's a reason why they're stuck in them. Um, so you know, be cognizant of that. You know, um, I worked in a lab, so obviously aseptic cleaning was kind of second nature. But things that you just want to be cognizant of, you know, it's a really good idea even to wash and clean your hands beforehand because your hands, you know, if you're close to the the top, can contaminate it. So um, don't touch the inside of the bottle or the lid. You know, try and keep the lid upright so that it's not face down on wherever you're putting it. Don't rinse the bottle because now you get rid of that uh, buffer that's in there. Um, there are because they put them through, um, you know, a measured test. Typically, they'll have a fill line on them, so trying to go above that. Although I know it is difficult sometimes. Um, replace the lid, close slightly. Like I said, refrigerate it within 24 hours uh, immediately, and then take it to the lab within 24 hours. And that'll all be laid out in there procedure as well. Um, and then uh, depending on the sample type there might be additional uh, steps and like even when you take your drinking water sample often they'll say you know make sure you wash flood the lines for a while you know a minute two minutes take off any screens and I, I mean I even have that question like well isn't that kind of I don't want to say tricking the system but is that not really true um, but again if, if those systems are being used because there's two different things now you're testing. You're testing your water. Um, so if your water, if you can, you can do both maybe, like kind of do an initial sample, but identify it to yourself and maybe label it as something different so that they're aware, you know, that you're aware that it's not that sample. Um, so maybe do the screens and that. So now you're actually just testing your equipment because if that comes back with an issue, but you're, after you've flushed it and whatever it comes back not, then it's like, maybe like, you know, that's an opportunity to say, hey, Maybe my equipment, there's something in my equipment, maybe my nozzles are contaminated. So, you know, there, there's two things that you can use that information for. But typically, um, they would say, sorry, I'm going to get, I don't know why that works. Um, I don't know if that'll get rid of that little thing on the bottom. Anyways, um, uh, you know, there's just additional steps that you might have to do depending on what you're saying. Um, okay, sorry, hopefully we'll have technical difficulties with this one. Um, this is, uh, will it be going through the same thing again? Okay. So this is how to test your water. Now it is more related to, um, it is related more to like sampling from, you know, like a, a, a faucet or whatever. Um, but again, it's just to give you an idea that there are methods in place and I just press play. Water make 
contain many microorganisms like E. coli and Campylobacter that can make you sick. These microorganisms can give you stomach cramps or diarrhea, and in some cases can be life-threatening. Frequent sampling of your drinking water will allow you to determine the bacteriological quality of your water supply. Monitoring your well water is important because water quality can change, especially during periods of heavy rainfall. It is recommended that you sample your well water at least three times per year, during or immediately following the spring mouth, midsummer, and fall. There are a number of steps to follow to ensure successful collection of a sample. The first step is to obtain a proper water sample bottle from the public health laboratory, local public health unit, or one of the designated pickup locations in your area. Only water collected in these containers will be accepted at the public health laboratory. Sample your well water when you're sure it can be delivered to the public health unit or designated drop-off location within 24 hours. Your water sample shouldn't be left sitting for a long period of time as this could lead to inaccurate test results. Wash your hands before taking your water sample. When you take a water sample, it's important to make sure it is truly representative of your water supply. Remove any equipment or attachments such as aerators or filters from your tap. Don't take your sample from an outside faucet or garden hose. Always take a sample from an indoor tap with no air in it. That faucet is a good example. Disinfect the end of the faucet to remove debris or bacteria before collecting your sample. Use an alcohol swab or a diluted bleach solution made by mixing a quarter teaspoon of household unscented bleach in a glass of water. Turn on a cold water tap and let it run for two to three minutes. This should be enough time to remove standing water from the plumbing system. Reduce the water flow to a steady, slow water stream to avoid excessive splash when filling the sample bottle. Remove the sample bottle lid, but be sure not to touch the inside of the lid. Do not put the lid down or rinse the bottle. Fill the bottle to the level that is clearly marked on the container and close the lid firm. Filling out the information form that accompanies each sample is important for tracking your results. If the required fields in the form are not filled out, your sample may not be tested. Write down the barcode number on the small pink form. This is your reference number. Write your name on the small peel out tab and stick it to the back of the bottle. Insert the completed information in the plastic sleeve and wrap it around the bottle. Your sample is now ready for submission. Keep the sample cool until it is delivered to the drop off location. Deliver the sample within 24 hours or it may not be processed. Remember, proper handling leads to accurate test results. Again, the steps are Obtain a proper water sampling bottle. Sample your water when it can be delivered within 24 hours. Always sample from an indoor tap with no air. Wash your hands before taking a sample. Disinfect the tap to remove bacteria and debris. Run water for two to three minutes before sampling. Fill the bottle to the level that is clearly marked on the container. Fill out all of the required paperwork. And keep the sample cool and deliver within 24 hours. Frequent accurate water sampling can help prevent the serious illnesses associated with poor water quality. Protect yourself and your family by protecting your source water supply. So, I realize there is, again, some repetition there, but like I said, it's always good to be reminded of those things that are really important because, um, you know, that, especially when we're testing our water, we want to make sure that it is a true sample of what we're, what we're doing and not just a result of us potentially contaminating the edges or whatnot. So, a question came up about, you know, what do you do if, you know, if you have an adverse result, and that's coming up in a couple of slides. So, what is that water really testing? And we have been over that a little bit. You know, the water test is a measure of the evidence of contamination that might be in that water sample. Um, again, it's giving us an idea of that, you know, the, the, the quality that of our water that we want to be using. Um, so, 
the other question too was about coliforms versus E. coli, or what is a coliform? Um, you know, it, they can be found in the gut, which is one of the reasons why they're used, but they also are found in the environment. So that's why the focus is more on the generic E. coli, where it's just found in the intestine, so therefore it's more of an indicative sample, or it um, gives us a better idea if it's just uh, fecal contamination. So you want to make sure that you are, you are aware of what those water test results would be. Um, and if it doesn't meet the requirements, you know, there is action that's required before you go ahead and use it. Now, of course, if it's agricultural water versus, uh, you know, potable water, depending on the application or the use of it, uh, those actions might be different. Um, so if your test results are too high, again, it's important to stop using the water. Agriculture may be not as big of a, a deal because, again, there are some limitations and it's, you know, it's not a standard. It's just a, a very strong recommendation if you have it tested. But most important, regardless if it's a bottle of water sample or a different water sample, you resample because you can see there's a lot of different areas where you know adverse results can happen. Whether you how you're storing it, how you sampled it, what you've touched, what you have, you know, lots of different things that could um, either give you a false positive or or something else. Um, but the key is if you've resampled and you're still getting an issue, chances are there is something wrong, and then you really need to look at the root cause of what might be causing that issue that's giving you adverse test results. Um, so there was a question before about what would a test result look like. So here is an example, and it's in your book there. So this particular one was just on a, a filtered uh, type of water sample. Um, there's a couple important pieces of information on this particular one to look at. You know, they will record the, the date that it's received. Um, uh, it'll give an ident identification number. Uh, what it's testing for, so this was total coliforms, and they just say fecal coliforms, but typically it's E. coli, they can be interchangeable. Um, and again, I apologize, this is a PDF, you should show it without the circles. Um, but something to note here, and, and there's different things that you can do to improve the quality of your water, we'll talk about that as well. Um, and this is a really great example of, um, so this water here, uh, of like something that you can do to improve your water sample. So this, these, this individual, whoever took the sample, uh, took the sample prior to the filtration and then after the filtration. And you can see here for total coliforms, uh, they had 72 coliform, 72 CFUs for that sample, and for fecal coliforms it was less than one. So depending on what type of water sample it was, potentially not an issue. But it really shows here that after filtration, both are well below detectable limits. So again, it's just it, it, this shows a lot of different things. One, you know, the type of how you might see your results, and two, just even how um, you know, different applications can be used to improve your water quality. So, back to testing your knowledge. Um, so, there's your correct answer. So, um, question one. So, which of the following is the hazard that can affect water quality? So, circle um, the correct answer. So, as we talked about, obviously, pathogens, chemicals, leachate is a different type of sort of runoff or, or something that can affect your groundwater. So, in this particular case, it's D. I believe you probably have that slide with all the answers on there. Um, and this one we talked about already in C. Um, you could do at a minimum, you want to sample three times per year. And the acceptable limits for generic E. coli for agricultural water are less than 100 colony farm limits. So what are the risks that might be related to pre-harvest water? Um, in this particular slide, and, and this is actually a good thing that you have in a nice and large on your book, but it just kind of gives you a, an illustration of sort of general, you know, rural potential issues. Um, so you have, like where the, the red circles are, that's more related, I think, to like your, your rural, your agricultural, but you know, if you have um, livestock, or animal access that might have access to your water source that can be go through runoff and leachate into your water source. Um, if you have agricultural chemicals running off into a nearby water source or the water source that you're using, even household, like whether it's a septic system or other, you know, other waste material that might be putting into the ground source, then that can uh, contribute to um, negative uh, water quality. Um, and just said that, like, there's a lot of different things, but that's a really good illustration of all the potential things that can affect um, water quality. So, different areas where you might be using, 
you know, pre-harvest water, there's an example list there, and we've talked about a few of them. Um, but again, it's just to be cognizant of, okay, where am I using water? What, you know, what do I need to be addressing if there is a risk? Um, so the risk with, uh, often with agricultural water, again, is that fecal contamination. So where are you going to get that, you know, warm-blooded animals, livestock, birds, family pets, um, even humans, I guess, as, uh, you know, as our, picture, our poster indicates, but, you know, maybe upstream you might have, maybe there's a campground, or maybe there's something where, you know, people might dump out from the trailers or something, you know, so again, it's just, you can't control that, but it's something to be aware of, and then potentially you could do something differently. Um, so prior to, to using the water, you want to sort of do a mini assessment and kind of address, okay, where are my highest risks? You want to identify what your, the water quality of that source water that you're going to be using. Um, you know, look at the type of crop, you know, is your, do you have a high risk crop and is that going to play a little bit into, you know, what you're doing or how you're administering or applying water? Um, and then how, how is it, how is it being used, your, your irrigation method? Um, you know, overhead versus sub, uh, you know, subsoil. So those are all different things that you need to address and look at. So when we look at source water, uh, you can see on the screen here in your slides that um, there's, you know, sort of more, more reliable sources than others. And I'm sure no surprise that for the most part and in a perfect world, municipal water is the most reliable source um, because it is treated and it is a regulated water sample. Um, as we get up, you know, kind of work our way up wells, you know, a little less variable than um, municipal water, but much better than a river or stream. Lakes, ponds, again, there's variability depending on what's going on in the surrounding environment and what might be nearby. And then, of course, rivers and streams. Really variable water source and not ideal uh, to use for irrigating your, your crop. So testing pre-harvest water, I don't think we really need to go through this anymore. Uh, we've seen it enough times, but again, just those things you need to be cognizant of and I, I, um, just make sure that you know where you're supposed to be sampling. And if you, there are some companies actually that, um, I can't remember off the top of my head though, there is one in that book that uh, they sort of joined forces with, uh, I think it, I want to say it's Orkin actually. Um, because Orkin goes to so many different areas for pest, you know, looking, looking at people's pest monitoring programs. They've set up a system where they've joined forces with this one laboratory. Well, they'll actually be trained to go and sample, well, they'll take your water sample and then deliver it as well for a cost. So, you know, for some people that might be great because then now they're the ones that are trained and taking that water sample and they should know what they're doing. If there's a water issue, then, you know, then it's up to them to maybe resample. Obviously not fix the issue if that's not the case, but, um, you know, there's maybe a little bit more consistency there because they're trained on how to properly sample water and they have their proper tools as well. When you say that, yes, something I've learned from Canada, yeah, is that even if you use an outside source, like sometimes they become compliant, like complacent in what they're doing, so you have to make sure that you still keep the records of everything. Oh, you still need those records and you still need to know, like, when it's been tested, who did it, and that. Um, you still need those water tests, so you need those in your possession. Um, and if there is an adverse result, you, you still need to be identified what caused that. So, say you are using a third party water sampler, and there's an issue, and there's an issue, then, I mean, you know, you either look at going out with them or having somebody else do it, or you may resort to this, you know, either having to do it yourself or get somebody else to do it. But, you know, you still have to identify, regardless of who's taking the sample, you need to have, you need to have those results in your possession and um, you need to be able to identify what the cause of that is. At to the best of your ability anyways. Um, and again, just questions to ask yourself, you know, if, you're, if there are quality issues, what could be causing those? Um, so crop risk. I talk about crop risk for a couple of reasons because as we've identified, there's higher, uh, there's crops with higher risk than others. Um, and that's often determined by, you know, how that, the portion that's being consumed or eaten um, you know, is it the fruit? Is it the leaves? Is it the roots? Um, is it eaten raw? We talked a little bit about this earlier. You know, do you peel it before you eat it? Do you cook it? Is it grown close to the ground? All of these things come into play um, when, you know, crop risk is being determined. Um, so here's an example list of some crops that vary in risk. Um, I want to point out something to you, though, because people want to say, well, how can much tomatoes on there twice? And very, you know, considerable difference as far as the risk. 
Well, when we look down here, processing tomatoes are uh, the least risky because one, they're typically harvested by machine, so you don't have that human contact, and then they go through a processing step that tends to kill most of the bacteria until you get to a canning process and all that, that adds things. But, um, so processing tomatoes, but when you get the fresh market tomatoes, hand harvested, eaten raw or eaten fresh, and they don't go through that kill step. Um, so again, just, just to point out that depending on the, on the product, and again, each supplier or retailer might have their own list, but typically, this is, you know, this is just an example list. So it's just, it's just good to know where yours sits in there. Um, so there might have different practices that you can implement for that. Water use is the, the third thing. How you're using it and when you're applying it um, plays a huge role into that. Um, you know, you have your uh, triple irrigation versus overhead irrigation, um, two completely different uh, methods, and uh, you know, definitely a different risk factor for both of those. Um, so. <laughs> It, it's easier put in print than in practice, I realize. So saying, oh, you know, make sure that you're not applying it directly to the crop. That's the part that's being seen, and well, that's all fine and dandy, but I can't tell the raindrops where to land or whatever. So I understand that. But if you do have an opportunity, because I know some people will also do sort of a, it's a sprinkler head, but it's very low to the ground, not really high. So again, if they have a higher crop, then obviously that, that, that risk is being a little bit reduced than if they're still spraying it over top and it's getting everything. So, um, you know, if it's possible to try and, you know, especially if you start off scratch, you know, to, to use the best irrigation method possible or implement that. Um, but where possible, you know, just try and be cognizant and, and see if there's ways that you can address that. Um, if there is, um, an issue with the water, um, you know, you think, gosh, this is my only water source that I have, like, what can I do? Um, there are different ways, different things that you can do, and especially if you're, um, say your crop might not need water close to harvest, then you might be able to abstain for a longer period of time, um, say, if you, you know, maybe a month in advance, so that, um, you know, it gives that opportunity for any of those pathogens to be killed or die off. And I know you can ask me, is there a set standard or a recommended time? Um, we don't have any scientific data in Ontario to support that type of practice, but in the states they have done a little bit, and sort of, I would say typically they say about two weeks, but again, two weeks of hot sunshine versus two weeks of dull and wet, big difference, right? So it is just kind of a guideline, um, but if you know you sort of have maybe not the most reliable source, then really try to extend that, um, either don't use it or really increase that uh, DHI if possible. So irrigation type, we talked a little bit about that before, versus uh, sprinkler overhead versus sub-irrigation. Obviously, sub-irrigation is going to be the least risky because you're typically going into the ground. Um, and then as you move up, um, the risk increases. Um, we already talked about this, this is at the onset, you know, because the pathogens can do a lot of different things. Um, you know, there is that risk, and especially if that water that you're using is contaminated, that now you're basically um, sprinkling Raining, basically raining pathogens on your product if you're using overhead irrigation that's contaminated. So application timing. This can be almost as significant as your water source. Um, again, if that source is not great or not of great quality, um, you really want to look at, okay, what's my irrigation method? What's my crop? What can I do to fix this? Um, you know, if you have overhead irrigation and you do have a risk of your crop and you need to irrigate, I mean, that's a, a choice you're going to have to make, but um, if there is an opportunity to extend that taste to harvest interval or use an alternative source, you know, um, or if you're just starting out with, you know, maybe implementing irrigation into your facility or at, uh, for your production, then, you know, maybe look at different opportunities that you might be able to use it or, you know, if you can use it from the source. I know even some people have the water tanked in, but I realize that that's on different scales. You can't do that in a thousand, a thousand acres. Um, there's a special case, maybe you can speak a little bit more to this specifically, but for greenhouse water, um, you need, your water source needs to be portable for a lot of instances post-harvesting, and I think it's um, for all of them pretty much, isn't it for green? For greenhouse, um, if you're overhead, if you have any overhead, like mist. any misting, or you're spraying any agricultural chemicals, uh, it needs to be portable water for those uses, and then the water, even drip water, Yeah, so just, again, if you're a greenhouse grower, just be cautious 
something that you know there is, and it's a little bit more stringent and prescriptive, uh, prescriptive when it comes to the portable water requirements and how you're using it. We touched on this a little bit right at the onset how when I had the three sort of columns up about the different, uh, you know, two, three major outbreaks that have occurred. Uh, this particular one is uh, on the, the baby spinach back in 2006. Um, it was in California. The contaminant was E. coli 0157. And you can see the impact there. People died, many people were sick, lots of people hospitalized. And from this study, they, they indicate that 15% of the people that were hospitalized will experience kidney failure at some point in life because of this. Um, this little boy, boy, Kyle, he died uh, as a result of eating that spinach. And the results, the reason why that spinach um, became contaminated was there was two things, but basically um, the water source that was being used to irrigate the spinach, and it was overhead irrigation, um, it was contaminated, uh, it was from the runoff from the nearby fields. Um, there was livestock and as well, I think it was, there was wild, I was it wild boar, wild, anyways, there was also wild livestock in that uh, vicinity as well, um, and it, it leached into the water source. And then there was also something, contamination of the groundwater, which also um, the well water source as well. So uh, a few different issues going on, but ultimately um, the water quality wasn't great, contaminated product, people ate it, people got sick, and people died. Um, and that's not good. And this particular instance is when I indicated where Kraft had, uh, they, they, they had claimed that basically every, people stopped eating spinach, stopped eating those uh, mixed green salads, the spring mix, and as a result, 40% reduction in sales in salad dressings. Like you think, I wouldn't even have thought that, but of course that makes sense, right? If uh, how many people are eating salads in the water, they're not going to be eating more spinach. Yes. On, on that note, yep. does the United States have to, when people are importing stuff into Canada, are they the same standards as the United States? Um, actually, the, the United States have um, the Food Safety Modernization Act, so they are getting, they're moving that way. I can't speak for, I, you know, what they have as far as standards, but I know they go through and they're starting to implement some rigorous um, import standards and qualities based on, on some of those things that have happened too, and the Food Safety Modernization Act. And they're starting to make a lot of uh, producers in that within and then exporting and importing as well meet those standards. And I don't know if you more to that or not, TJ, but like just with the standards and that, they're starting to really sort of beef up their requirements too, and, you know, globally as well as far as the requirements for importing and exporting. But when you say that um, Canada Gap is standardized, is it standard? The U.S. has their
point that, you know, that also needs to be addressed, that you know, there's other, definitely want to cross that off, you know, make sure that everything's checked to make sure that you're trying to do what you can. Um, so reducing the risk, um, it's easier to obviously present, prevent issues from happening than um, trying to deal with them afterwards. So prevention is a key, and, and, and that's really what we're talking about. Just knowing that there are potentials for risk, and the best thing we can do, what we can do to mitigate them, is really the best practice. Um, I, that's just that same slide that's in my presentation. So, um, so when we look at you know, what's our focus point for when we're talking about irrigation water? And we want to make sure that, you know, it's actually, you know, to sort of work before the issue is to happen. So you want to make sure that you're protecting that water source. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, again, by protecting that, we're going to help preserve our water quality. And then we move into irrigation type, you know, is it the most suitable delivery method for the water source that we have? Is there something else that we can do? And then also, um, even the water test video showed that, that, you know, you want to make sure that it's your water source that's good, but your water source might be fantastic, but you're still having an issue, and it could actually be the equipment that you're using. So it's just, it's important to know those things. So, oh, right. Um, sorry, another issue with PDF. That's, I knew there was a reason why I didn't want to do it, not PDF. But anyways, um, there's different examples uh, that are varied here. Um, so one is you want to restrict uh, livestock. You know, if you know that you're using a, a, a certain pond, if there's any way that you can restrict it by putting up fencing or, you know, extended vegetative buffers, that's a really great way. Um, electric fencing. Uh, buffer strips are fantastic, but, you know, as it says down there, you know, you can have a t five to ten meter buffer strip of cereal crops and it can actually reduce the contaminants entering up, like reduce it by 90% just by having that, you know, that vegetated area. Um, and then some people even construct a holding pond to divert some of the runoff so that they can they have a, a more, uh, a better quality water source to use. So things that you want to consider, crop risk, how you apply your water, um, when you apply, um, and then is there other water sources. So water treatment's another thing that, you know, if, especially like if you're using a cistern or something where you have a holding tank, uh, there are some odd options for water treatment. I realize with agricultural water, it's a little bit more tricky or challenging than if, you know, you sort of have a contained system for post-harvest water. Um, but there are different things, and like you saw in that one water test, filtration, filtration is a great option. Um, but there are specific, uh, sometimes there's specific size requirements of like the fil filter pores to make sure that you're capturing everything. But with that also, um, you know, flow rate can be affected because there, you know, if you have really tiny pore size, then a lot of water is not going to get through. So obviously you have to make sure that you're using something that's more suitable for your operation and your treatment system. UV treatment is another option. Um, so that's using a light source to kill off uh, pathogens that again, Flow rate depends, and if, if, if water's flying too far, like going too quickly, and there's a lot of debris, we won't be addressing everything. So these are things that you need to be concerned about. And then chemical treatments, if you want to use a sanitizing agent, so that is a potential of, uh, treatment option. Um, usually, there's a conduct like a usually some of those things will be used in conjunction. So often you'll see UV with filtration, um, just because it you know it uh, it just it increases your uh, the potential for properly treating the water. I don't really want to, it's not that I don't want to, but you need to keep in mind when it's such water, if there is a potential issue, protect the water, and then if needed, you might need to treat the water. But treatment doesn't always mean chemical, there are some other things that you can put in place, um, but you just have to make sure that it's most suitable for overall. Um, and it's really important to, too, you know, if you have an irrigation line to inspect them, because often they'll get chopped or nicked or chewed or whatever. Um, so you really want to make sure that the system um, that you're using is, is regularly inspected and, and maintained to ensure that your water quality is staying optimal as well. Okay, post-harvest water. I'm looking at the time. Okay, um, quiz number two, testing your knowledge. So circle the risks that can be associated with post-harvest water. So A, organic matter, and then so initial vents, temperature of the water, quality of the final rinse, and sanitizer concentration. Um, so those is risk slash risks. Uh, question two, um, it's only important to test the final rinse water, true or false. 
Um, question three. Once the water treatment process has been validated, there's no need for further monitoring of the water quality, true or false. And lastly, water, safe, water is safe for use when the test results read zero CFUs, sanitizer is used, the tank is refilled, and UV light is used. So we'll talk about that in a few minutes. I'm sure you can probably answer a lot of that um, at this point based on our conversation so far. Okay. Sorry, I think I'm getting as hurt as everybody else here. So um, I could dance for you that, but that would probably just really disinterest you more than my speaking slides are. But uh, anyway, so what well, water is included? We talked about that. So again, anything after harvesting your product, uh, but it also could be involved in cleaning some of those harvest containers. So keep that in mind. Just because they're used in harvest, um, you know, you might need to be using potable water for different areas. So um, and there are some examples listed there. So your harvest bin, your RPCs, um, you know, any of that packed house equipment, and uh, of course your water cans. Um, there's those water use guidelines. So zero zero for potable water. Um, and then obviously. Again, I think this goes, it doesn't really need an explanation, but obviously if your water's contaminated, it can be extremely detrimental to your product and even your, your, your whole process because your equipment or, and your surrounding environment can become contaminated from the water that you're using, which can greatly impact the uh, safety of your product. And that holds true whether it's pre-harvest or post-harvest. Um, and then a final note that, you know, any of that final water, whether it be water or a different form such as ice or slurry, must be bottled. Uh, there is a legislation that does say that only potable water can be used in that final rinsing. We've talked about that already lots of times. Um, there, you know, the K and Local uh, Health Act, um, it tells you where you can find that information there. Um, but really, it is the best practice if you can, you know, to use potable water for all post-harvest uses, and then there's no guesswork, and then it really does reduce that risk. So if, there, if there's a way to achieve that, then that really truly is the best way, because you do require potable water for most of the practices anyway, so to try and determine one versus the other, it's best to just keep it potable at all times. Um, you can see this list is very similar to the pre-harvest, so prior to using water, you want to make sure that you know, um, you're identifying what that water source is and the quality of it, the crop type. And this is going to be, some of this might not, you might not know this about the crop type, but it's a little bit different when we talk post harvestly um, Sure, the crops have different risks, but some crops, uh, cantaloupes, tomatoes, apples, um, they actually uh, can be affected by the water temperature as well. So if the water temperature that they're floating in or submerged in, um, if it's, if it's colder or a different temperature, then it can actually pull in the water. And if that water is contaminated, now you're contaminating the internal cavity of your product. Your outside might look fine, you might not know it's contaminated. Um, so there are some other additional risk factors when you're talking about crop type post harvestly And then um, again, determine you know where you're using water and does it need to be uh, potable. So again, very similar. Uh, you can see, you know, if you're using any of those things for post-harvest, that you need to get cognizant of which ones are more risky than others and try to go for the more safe uh, route if you can. Um, there's some examples of source water again. We're talking about source water, so, you know, a greenhouse is a great example where they might use a, a holding tank for collection cisterns, so that would be then your source water in this particular case. Food tanks, as identified in this particular manual, could be your actually your food water because that's the, your, your initial starting water for the rest of the process. Uh, wells and municipal water source. Um, so the crop type, and I don't mean to be flying through this, but some of it just feels like we've talked yeah. about some of this already. <laughs> uh, so um, I so some of the crops have a higher risk and are sensitive, like I was alluding to just a minute ago. Um, cantaloupes, for an example, which is a, uh, you know another cause to what happens. Um, they are a high risk, um, and now indeed high risk because of that massive outbreak, but um, not only because of that, but that they have a lot of surface area on their, um, their external surface, but because of this uh, property that um, they are temperature sensitive as well. Um, so they have that risk of internalizing that food water. So here's an example slide to demonstrate that. So what has happened here, um, there is dye put into the water, and so, uh, 
and we would have to figure that the um, the water was colder than the product. So it's just if you think of yourself jumping into a cold lake or cold pool and you're like, oh my gosh, and everything kind of shrinks up and you know, whatever, same thing with, with, with a product. Um, if the water is cold, it does that same thing. The, the cellular um, matrix of it constricts and it pulls the water in. So if you just think, and in this case the water was blue, like it was dyed water on purpose, um, it constricted so it pulled all that dye in. So you can see if this was contaminated water, uh, which it was but dye, but you know what I mean, um, this is what you would start to see. So this is, this is how that happens. So again, you need to be cognizant of you know, the practices that you're using and as well as the, as the crop that you're using. Um, and then there's different things now for cantaloupe, like only submerging it part of the way, not full submersion, because then you try to reduce that as well. So, and, and continue to speak more to that. People are uh, interested for the Canada, I love the cantaloupe. And then, um, obviously you want to determine, you know, how you're using that water. Um, we have talked about areas where you need potable water, it's an absolute must. Um, so you need to, um, you know, make, make sure that you're making those qualities. This, uh, this, Diagram is sort of like a copy and paste from um, a full big diagram. But what this picture is showing, it, and I apologize, it is a bit fuzzy because it's, it's like a big, almost like a blueprint. Um, but this is sort of like your initial process. This is sort of a pack house, just basically a wash, sort, pack type facility. Um, no, like, uh, minimally processed. But you can see they have a dump tank, they have a bin washer, uh, some sorting rollers and cups. And then the product goes around, and then it goes up here. And there's a plume tank, take up rollers, and the brush bed, and then there's a waxer and final mix. So you can see on here that um, you need potable water for a lot of these areas. Um, and then obviously, this is where they're using water post harvesting. So you can see, you know, more than half of those areas you need potable water. So just, you know, it's always, especially now that we have the Canada Gap manuals in front of us. Um, Canada Gap or even some other uh, food safety programs, they might have an auto fail or a major non conformance, and non conformance just means that you're not um, meeting the requirement that's there. And usually, if it's a major non fail, obviously it's a direct food safety risk um, that needs immediate attention. So, in these particular cases, um, you know, for water, uh, it needs to be confirmed to potable. Um, you might need, say, you pack broccoli and you have ice, um, but you don't make your own ice and you get it to get it shipped in. So you need a, like, a letter of assurance or a letter of conformance to say, hey, you know what, the water that was used to make that ice has, was portable. So you'd almost want to have a water test or from that supplier saying, yes, it's a, it's a portable source. Um, if you make your own ice, you need those same type, that same type of documentation, but you'd also, the equipment that you use to make that ice, um, you need to show like a regular, like a regular cleaning and sanitizing schedule for that uh, particular device to make that ice as well. Um, Portable water, like we talked there, uh, again, for washing all of your final product and all the containers that are associated with your final product, misting um, and making ice. Um, and now here's a case study where um, it's a shorter one, just just to kind of drive home the point a little bit. But this was parsley and uh, it was actually British Columbia and parsley is a leafy green so there's a higher risk there and the particular contaminant in this case study was shigella and a lot of people became sick and it actually spanned um, across a couple of provinces and into the United States and what happened is that they were putting a uh, product into the tank that was a little bit contaminated but that water that they were using it was recirculated but it wasn't treated so as keep adding more and more and more and the, you know, the build up the organic matter in that tank just kept increasing and increasing. So now all the stuff coming out of it was contaminated. Like, um, it just, it wasn't a good scenario. So, um, and then there's a little bit of a, a demonstration, but um, they did some research studies um, as part of our group a couple of years ago where they took a leafy green, I don't know if it was parsley in that, in that particular one, but it was a leafy green. Um, where they identified that 15% of the product prior to going into the wash tank was contaminated. The water was, you know, reused, recirculated, but wasn't treated. Coming out, 80% of that product was not contaminated. 
So it just goes to show you that if you're not putting the proper processes in place and there's issues, potential issues, they could be much bigger issues that they're not taken care of. So you want to make sure that that water is sanitized or treated. Uh, so the lessons learned, obviously, and that example as well, that water is a very good vehicle to transfer pathogens and, and contaminate other things. You really should use a type of sanitizer to, um, especially this recycled water, um, because again, your organic load is just going to keep building and building, and, and it really does need to be addressed and, and taken care of. Um, we talked about ice, and we also talked about leafy greens. Obviously, we want to prevent contamination before it becomes an issue. Uh, I'm not. I'm going to kind of look through some of the ESAs protecting water. Um, this is just a little quiz. You can sort of upload it. Um, it is in your book, and then there, I think the right answers are in there as well, in the back of your uh, slide deck. Um, but how many times should water be tested per year as a minimum? Two. Thank you. Um, and when should it be done? Both. Beginning with the six and the middle of the six. Thank you. Prior to use, yep. Um, if we have screens and filters, do we keep them in or take them off? Right, unless you want to see if the other parts of your product are, are like their systems contaminated. Um, we haven't talked about this, I might have even skipped over it, but do you think that you can do a composite sample of wash lines or not? No. When you're sending your water sample? No. And you actually can. Yes. Right? <laughs> right, TJ? Like you can. You can do it, but obviously there's a risk involved. So say you have five wash lines. And you should probably do a little bit of a history before you go jump right into that. Say you have, you've done it for maybe two or three years in a row, or three or four or five tests have shown, you know what, I've, I've tested five of them individually, we're good. Then you can start doing it, that's the suggested route, rather than jump right in and do a composite sample. But the risk, obviously, if you have a composite sample, there's an issue, now you're like, great. Is it one, two, five, three, all of them? So then you would obviously have to go back and resample and try to identify the root cause. So, like I said, I'd probably do the first method first, kind of get yourself built up, see what the trends are. If you're, you know, if you're doing good, you're doing good, then maybe reduce it down to a composite sample. But just be prepared if there's an issue that you're going to have to identify that go Um And then when you take a water sample, if it's sort of through a type or a, a pipe or a hose, would you flush it or not flush it? Flush it. Right. I know, it seems pretty rudimentary simple, but okay. Um, so, there should be a yellow sheet. I know we probably don't have time, but I'm going to read it anyway just because I'm, you guys don't need to hear me talk anymore for a couple minutes. So, there should be a yellow sheet at the back, and there's three, yeah, right there. So, there's, um, I don't know, it's an example to show up, but basically, it's, it's at the back of your, uh, here, can I just borrow yours? So there's a yellow sheet here. It's sort of like at the, almost at the back of your section, kind of after those slides. Um, so there's this, this is an example of three water tests. Um, how many tables do we have here? So these are the questions I want you to answer. Um, how about you do the first, the each, so you do number one, you do number one. Second tables do number two, number three, Katidra and Cornelius do number one, and you guys do number two at the very, very back. And just talk about it for us, give you a couple minutes, um, or just answer it on your own, but I just do So these are the questions, so they're back in your slide deck, or you can use them up here. So what I want you to do is I want you to answer those questions, so it's the first, so there's three tests on that page, one, two, and three. So answer the questions based on the information that we've talked about, answer these questions. So give you a couple minutes just to talk and not hear me talk.
and look for some cues in those descriptions if it says if it's the final water, only water. Uh, what was the 
purification of the water. Lines one to four, initial, initial rinse. Initial rinse. So there's two things that we know here. Uh, one, it's a composite, right? So it's a combined sample. And then two, it's the initial rinse. So initial rinse, there is that potential that there could be maybe more water down the line, like a final rinse, right? So there is a little bit of leeway there. Uh, but again, going towards the best practice, we should make sure that it's always potable. Um, okay, so, um, so the initial rinse uh, doesn't meet the guidelines. Of, um, yes, agricultural, no for Thank you. Perfect. Um, and again, we are aiming for potable for post harvest just to make life a little easier. Um, so it doesn't meet uh, the CCMB guidelines. So what are some immediate things that you might do, knowing based on that? Sanitize. You could. Recut. Yeah. What's that? Recut. Yeah, that would be a, a good first thing initially, right? Just to make sure that you actually sample it properly, that your hands are dirty or whatever. Um, and then what's another thing? Because we know something sp specific about this water sample. Oh. Right. Lines. Yeah, check the lines. Check the lines. But what's uh, unique about the sample that, you know, we might say, hey, Water source might be different. Uh, it could be. Um, Shampoo lines separately. That's right. Yeah. Because we made a composite. You know, again, just because, you know, oh my gosh, we don't want to like rip out everything if it was maybe one line and maybe it's just the, the spray bar's dirty, the initial rinse, or maybe the tank's dirty, right? So, again, you don't want to go full Monty and say, oh my gosh, we're going to destroy everything, take out everything, but, you know, resample, sample separate lines and then maybe sanitizing or using some sort of filtration or sanitizing would be the next step. So that's the next question um, for number five. You know, what some steps, what some JPs that you could put in um, for that. So sanitizing was one of them. Um, maybe verify the sampling method that was used. Um, something that was way back in the beginning of my, my speaking uh, engagement here, but um, something as simple as verify your worker training. That they even know how to sample it properly. You know, that just might be the simple, the root of the problem right there. They just didn't realize that they were supposed to blow on it, rinse it out, throw the cap on the ground. Um, you know. Um, so for the last one, uh, water uh, test. Question just before you go. Yes. Why would you not, uh, on your final rinse, check total pulp forms? I I was just being goofy there. I mean, more more just. I mean, you almost always will test coliforms and generic E. coli, um, but the true test for fecal contamination is is the E. coli. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I usually do. Um, and, and Lorraine brought it up earlier. She's like, could you have like maybe two? And I mean, I don't want to say you can have two, and then people are like, oh, well, I was allowed to have two, so now I can have five. I don't, you know what I mean? But so typically, it's it is the generic E. coli one that's the focus. And even for the agricultural oil, you can see the difference. Total coliforms are allowed a thousand, whereas E. coli, um, it's like a tenth factor, it was a hundred. So the E. coli is typically the one you focus on. Um, I think that I was just being, I don't know, tricky, I guess. Um, and then the last one, uh, water test number three. Um, what's the location of the water test? What's that? Boom tank, yeah. And what's something else that we know about that particular water? The only water use. Right, so if it's the only water use, it's also last water. That's right. So there's some important things that we need to know, right? If it's only if it's the last water to test a product, and Katija, maybe you should comment on that, but typically if it's the last water to touch a product, it has to be potable. Um, so what are the um, so does it is it meeting the uh, guidelines if it needs to be potable? Not at all, right? So, uh, what would we do then immediately? Stop using the water. That's right. And then our, our next step would be resample to make sure that we did everything right. And then, if there's still an issue, then we start to look at the root cause. What are some things that you would do uh, as a good agricultural practice uh, if you did have a, an issue with that water? Yeah? Switch to the a switch to the like municipal water. Yeah. You'll check the water source and then switch if you had to, if that was an option. Um, even on operational activities. Um, yes, sir? What's a flume tank? A flume tank is, um, can be like a dump tank or a wash tank in Apple. So it, it comes before these other conditions, right? Um, it can. 
depending yeah, on the. Yeah. I don't to go back to that. Uh, So here, um, sorry, it's not right. So this one, in this particular operation, it's used sort of as the floating, um, like they, I mean, use, this is from so an actual. last step before packaging. Uh, this one, actually, there's another one here, there's a washer, and then there's a brush bed, and then a waxer. This one's for apples. So often the flume tank can be like a wash tank. It can also be just the tank to get it from the point of, in the big bins up to the point where it needs to be packaged. So apples is an example of that. So they'll use the big harvest bins that are about a thousand pounds. They get submerged in the water, the apples float, and then the water carries it up in rollers. So that's another, and they use, where I work, they use the word flume tank, whether it was the right, you know, flume, wash, dump. I think there's another word that they can use for it. So, um, so in that particular uh, situation in this one, um, one that we didn't really talk about, but sometimes, you know, with those dump tanks or the shigella or the shigella, the parsley or stuff like that, when you have a lot of product going into the tank, yeah. you know, something you need to think about, how often are you changing that water? If it is recirculated, that's fine. And you know, if you are treating it, that's fine. But there's going to be a point where it can't take anymore. Um, so, you know, that's something else, operational activities. You know, should you be, depending on the type of product that's coming in, how much product you're putting through the system, one day you might only put 100 bins, but the next day you might put 500 bins. And I'm just using bins for just a reference point. Um, so you might have a huge amount of organic load, so again, maybe it's an opportunity to increase the, you know, maybe you might change the, the water in the tank uh, once a day, once a week, depending on the type of uh, the time of season. Um, so, and then just as a reference point, you do have this in your binder. That's your answer sheet. So. Um, so we just talked about this, you know, if your water standards are being met for your source and your final contact water, what are some things um, that you can start to look for? These are some questions that you can start to ask to help you, you know, do that decision tree. Um, and it is really most important to always try and achieve and maintain that potable water quality. Um, prior to use that food tank should be potable. So, Katija, you can fill it. It doesn't necessarily have to be potable water to fill it, but before using it, it has to be potable. So you mean you can treat it to make it potable. Is that correct? Yeah. So does that make sense to everybody? So that's why we can, we can consider the flume tank or the wash tank or the dump tank as your water source because that's the first water, you know, for the next stage of the process. So not that it's recommended, but you could potentially fill it with maybe uh, a variable source, maybe a not completely potable source but you'd have to sanitize it or treat it accordingly and make sure that it's potable prior to using it for the rest of the process. So best to start off with potable water. Uh, and then obviously you must uh, treat recirculated water for all the reasons we've already talked about. Um, you can maintain it by changing the water frequently, uh, you know, maintaining sanitizer concentrations, um, you know, if you're using specific equipment to, you know, automatically inject some of those chemicals, you want to make sure that they're calibrated and maintained accordingly. Um, again, product load versus the capacity of your tank. You want to make sure that, you know, you're doing what you can to uh, make your system most optimal. Um, and then make sure that you're having regular sampling. And then if you are using composite samples, then be aware that there is a risk with that if there is an adverse result. We've talked about water quality more enough until the cows come home. Um, <laughs> sorry. No cows allowed. No cows allowed in water. Sorry, bad reference. <laughs> um, our water source is good to know. Um, yeah, so all these things, again, I, I don't feel like I need to say them. So, And that's why there is a lot of repetition, but um, originally we, d we designed this so that you know there was a pre-harvest, post-harvest, post -harvest, depending on the clients if they had either. Um, one, I do want to talk about this though uh, before sort of dismissing the subject. Um, the role of sanitizers, there might be a little bit of a, a misconception here, but when we're using sanitizers to treat water, that's exactly what it's doing. It's treating the water. It's not treating the product. So it might have a little bit of effect on if your, water's contam uh, if your product's contaminated, but what it's doing is maintaining the water so that if stuff sloughs off or whatever, and there's organic load in the tank, that it's keeping your water safe for the rest of the product that's going through. It's not, it's not meant to treat or make your product safe or better if it's already contaminated. Um, and this is just an example of that. Um, so those little 
uh, yellow comes again, this is in the non PDF version. These are your bacteria, they float around, sanitizer in the water, but then attack the bacteria and, and work on the bacteria in the water, not on the product. Uh, I would not suggest using this as a good example, it looks like mud. Um, so, not, uh, obviously, there's no sanitizers, but it's just a point of reference. Um, so, there's some sanitizing options. We've talked about chlorine, hydrogen peroxide. Um, and then uh, there is a CFIA list of accepted materials on the USB stick. There will be a page that has the active link in it. You can click on that. Um, the best method really is to go to the CFIA list um, at the inspection.gc.ca and do a search for that because they often change the website quite a lot and it can be a little bit tricky to find. So even if we have provided you the link, you can go back next month and it could have changed. So um, I always find it better just to search for it. Um, and there are organic options as well. Um, I don't know whether they're on here, but um, obviously we need to have another look because there's some that are now uh, have been removed from that list. So um, important to know that sanitizer effectiveness can be very different. Um, they can work very differently based on one the concentration and the organic load that's present because again the sanitizer is going to work on that organic stuff. Um, but it needs that direct contact, uh, you know, to have that effect. Um, always follow the label instructions, and you can do that through a couple of ways. Um, but you know, you can't follow the label instruction in different ways. That's not what I meant. But there's a lot of different information on the label to help you use that product appropriately uh, for its intended use, the intended um, uh, concentration. Um, and one thing to note, you can, say for chlorine, for example, you might use it in the water as a sanitizing option, but then you might want to use it as a spray bottle. Those would have different concentrations, so you need to make sure that you're using it um, how, it's, how it's being applied. There are test strips that you can test to ensure that you know, you're meeting the proper pH or the, uh, the concentration of your sanitizer. Uh, one thing with chlorine in particular, because it binds very quickly to organic matter, you want to make sure that you have chlorine, step, uh, chlorine strips of free chlorine, because that's what's still left available, not for the total chlorine. If it's total chlorine, it's also going to test the stuff that's bound, and that stuff's not going to do anything for your process, because it's already done its job, so you want the free chlorine. There's also um, ORP meters. Um, they test sort of like pH and millivolts and how they're interacting, the hydrogen ions, a whole bunch of stuff. Um, you can have a handheld device here, but $100, uh, but again, because it's equipment, it needs to be calibrated and maintained, but that can, it's a very quick way to test if your sanitizer is working and if it's at the proper um, concentration. And there's just a summary and your answers to your quiz. So, um, so A, B, and C, so all of the above, I know it wasn't an option, but you can just circle them all individually, so all of those are applicable. Um, it, it's important to test all of your water, so it's um, not necessarily, I mean, it's not, you need to test your, your final for sure, but you should test all your water. Um, and then, um, what's this one? Just because your process is validated, meaning that it's doing what it's supposed to do, doesn't mean you stop testing. Um, you need to continue to always monitor your, your system because anything can go wrong, and it is about monitoring that system and um, water safe for use when the test results are zero. Um, you know, you can use sanitizer, but if it's not working, it's not going to be any good. Um, just because you refill the tank doesn't mean it's safe water, and obviously UV is just one method of treatment. But if it's not working or not being used appropriately, then it's not. Good. 